China's crewed flight Shenzhou 13 is setting new records in space exploration, kicking off China's longest space day mission successfully on Saturday, that is October the 16th. It will stay in space for a record six months to match the international standard followed by the astronauts of the International Space Station. And this is the first time the three-member crew includes a female Taikong knot who will possibly walk in space. So what are the trio's tasks in space, what are the challenges ahead, and what's next for China's space program. Our guests, NASA space scientist uh, Amitabha Ghosh and Zhang Fan, associate professor of astronomy at Beijing Normal University, will share with us their answers. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Uh, professor Zhang, let me go to you first. Shenzhou 13 was launched just a month after the return of Shenzhou 12, an earlier crewed flight that stayed in space for 90 days. So how is this mission different besides the longer duration and what are the key tasks in the space lab? Right, so both of these two missions, they belong to what's called technology verification phase of the construction. Um, or in other words, their commissioning uh, missions. So Shenzhou 12, the last mission, was up there to basically test the, the intrinsic internal workings of the uh, Tiangong Space Station, uh, sorry, the Tianhe One core module itself, which includes the uh, testing the regenerative uh, life support system, which is necessary for people to stay there for a long duration of time, and also testing the robotic arms, uh, th which is necessary for replacing fuel on the outside for the uh, hold effect thrusters to maintain orbit. So all of that is necessary for the uh, long-term uh, permanent stay functioning of the of the Tianhe One core model. Module for this time, the uh, Tian Shenzhou Thirteen, the mission has shifted onto testing the uh, capability of additional modules to attach onto this, uh, this core module. Uh, so it's geared more towards in construction. For example, it will be testing the ability of the ro robotic arm to shift the position of, for example, a, a lab module later on, uh, shifting it from the, uh, the, the docking port onto the, uh, the birching port. Uh, so that kind of things. Um, they're, they're, they're basically completely different tasks in, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of different mm -hmm. aspects of the station being tested. Right, a lot of technicalities there, but we can imagine that this is a, a more complex and a more technical mission than the, uh, than the previous one. Mr. Gosh, this is also the first time Chinese astronauts or Chinese Taikong knots are staying in space for six months. What physical and mental challenges do they face? For example, I read that their space suits w could weigh about 20 kilograms, while each while the suits for outside cabin activity are about 100 kilograms each. Right, so there are multiple challenges of staying in space for this long. The very first is because of low gravity, your muscles atrophy, um, your bones lose calcium. So you, when, you, you, when, when the astronauts come back, they have to recondition themselves um, to, to Earth again, the Earth's gravity. The other, um, I, I would say, very prominent um, uh, uh, phenomena which is really uh, um, talked about is uh, the psychological effect. So mm. imagine, so we are uh, very um, dependent creatures. Um, we depend on what's around us. Specifically, I'm talking about what time the sun comes up and sun goes down. So imagine you're going around the earth and every... 90 or so seconds, you have a sunrise and a sunset. So your circadian rhythm is, I think, completely messed up. So you, you can do things to reform that, but um, I think it's a huge challenge um, to get reconditioned to that. So, so it's both the psychological and also, you know, the isolation of space. You know, humans are really uh, very social creatures. We intend to go out and meet people and talk to people and suddenly you are in this box in the middle of space in isolation for six months. And so mentally that can be, I think, quite a um, mm -hmm. challenge. Mm, definitely. Um, Shenzhou 13 marks the latest step in China's space station program, which aims for now to complete the space station Tiangong or Heavenly Palace by next year. 
and Tiangong will have three parts. We are not seeing the images here, but we will. And the first, uh, which is mentioned by Professor Zhang, is called the space module, that's Tianhe, which is already in space and operational since April. So Professor Zhang, once again, help us walk through the design of the station. What's different about it, let's say, compared with the International Space Station? Right. So, so, the, so the, the major difference, and uh, which is quite interesting actually, is that the uh, Chinese station consists of a relative few number of very large modules. So for example, the Tianhe core module just by itself is, is 20 some tons, and it serves <coughs> the same function as three different modules on the uh, International Space Station. So that means to achieve the same functionality, you need less number of modules, and less number of launches. That's why the uh, construction schedule can be so tight. It just takes one year and, and, and should be ready by the next year, by the end of next year. Uh, but that also poses challenges when you launch really heavy stuff and try to assemble them in place. Because uh, when you have heavy stuff colliding in space, you know, obviously the force is stronger. And then when you try to move one piece to a different angle than the inertia, the, the resistance to, to that move is higher. And, and the whole thing, because everything is similar sized, uh, the whole station will actually be somersaulting when the uh, tra transformation of, of the shape of the, of the Tiangong station happens. So all of that uh, causes difficulties in controls. So, so a lot of new technologies um, goes into this, this station to make sure that kind of construction mm. Uh, can, can actually happen. Right. Mr. Gosh, very briefly, what has caught your uh, imagination or your attention about the design of the Chinese space station? See, I'm sure it is a more updated design. So whatever gets built recently is perhaps has um, later technology. So I'm sure I'm not familiar of what new technology is there, but I'm sure um, the technology is probably um, somewhat updated from um, the space station from the international space station for example you know you have automated um, docking which of course the spacex has recreated that but so that is something new and i hear that um, the chinese space station also has automated docking so so there are i would say since it's built later there's bound to be some technology of um, advancement. Mm. Since China was not allowed to join the International Space Station by a, uh, you know, hampered by U.S. law passed in 2011, China started to design its own spacecraft and now its uh, own space station. And in September, actually, there have, there have been calls uh, of uh, some level of uh, collaboration or opening. For instance, Elon Musk called for at least some amount of cooperation between NASA and China. Mr. Gosh, what's your view? Do you think people are more open-minded about the idea now? I think on the ground level, um, when you talk to scientists and astronauts, um, there is perhaps, um, so they, they really uh, care about the cause of science. And so they would be more open. But of course, uh, everyone has to abide by what the government um, uh, position on that matter is. But here is one very important realization, other than the Wolf Amendment, which um, precludes NASA from directly collaborating with NASA, uh, with, with, with China. Both NASA and Ch China are in different stages of development of their space program. So NASA is really headed to the moon. In 2024, they want to get humans back to the moon. And um, China is starting out on their next space station. So, so I think the difference, and I guess the phased difference in the developmental stages also um, precludes a little bit of this collaboration because you kind of have to be interested in the same type of thing. Mm. So, um, so that is my thought. Right. Well, from the Chinese side, during a press briefing on Shenzhou 13, the spokesperson of China Manned Space Agency said the CMSA hopes to see cooperation with astronauts from other countries on Tiangong once it becomes fully operational. Professor Zhang, if the U.S. wants to join it, would China be open to it? Would the U.S. take this offer in the spirit it's been made? Right, so um, 
so it's openly stated by the Chinese administration that uh, uh, any country is welcome to join if they uh, they follow the same procedures. Uh, for example, the, uh, the the Chinese space station will be operated like a key state laboratory, so it's a scientific establishment, and the collaboration will will follow the usual scientific norms. So by that I mean people different countries can submit their proposals to the UN Office of Outer Affairs, Outer Space Affairs. And then once their proposal is selected, you know, the, they got free trip up and down, they got, uh, they got free hosting, and then, and then they share the, uh, the, the scientific output with the host, and, and then everything is just a scientific norm. And U.S. actually did uh, submit proposals, and it was given the due consideration, just like everybody else. Um, as for whether the U.S. will follow the, the, the spirit of this, uh, this, we'll this take collaboration, this uh, that really yeah, whether they will take depends this on whether the, yeah. the, the project is driven by scientists or by yeah. So, so the scientists would definitely take this offer because it's free. And uh, after the International Space Station retires, it's pretty much the only space station up there. Um, at least, at least, for, at least for for for, for purely uh, sort of a research purpose. If if, if there's like a, a commercial station up there, then uh, they will definitely charge you a, a lot of money. Mm. Um, so, so they would want to. Certainly, the, the scientists would want to take that opportunity. Right. Uh, but the, the problem is whether they will be hamstrung by their politicians. Finally, Mr. Gosh, your specialty is Mars, and China's space program also includes its Mars rover Zhurong, which uh, finished a 90-day expedition on the red planet in August, sending back images and data in China. Also has future plans to bring back samples from Mars. Can international and Chinese scientists work together on Mars exploration? Well, you know, part of it they are already doing that. I, I don't know about China, but. Um, NASA puts all its data out there on the internet for anybody to use, uh, for anybody to study. Um, I'm assuming the Chinese have also some sort of a data collaboration program. Um, so in a sense, they're already doing that. Whether uh, China will have a U.S. instrument on a, on a next mission and vice versa, um, that of course depends on geopolitics, the Wolf Amendment and everything else. So that's very hard to predict. But I think, um, uh, as, um, as I said before, the scientists are always interested in more um, studies and more scientific hypotheses and more data sharing. Many thanks to my guests. We have to leave it there. Ami Tabao Ghosh from a former NASA specialist and uh, Zhang Fan joining us from Beijing Normal University.